Uh, welcome back. I think we're starting. It's really hard to tell because we don't see people trickling into the room. But anyway, <laughs> here we go. So hi, I am Alan, and this is the second part of the online learning and bandit tutorial. Thanks, Valter, for the uh, really informative first part. And while Valter talked about online learning, I'm going to talk about bandits. So uh, the first question is, um, why is my Zoom? OK, here we go. Uh, what is a bandit? Well, a bandit is kind of it's a, a similar language for from full information, where it's, it's a way to describe interacting with the world through basically playing a game with some adversary. Um, maybe it's stochastic or maybe it's adversarial, but we're really modeling um, why, why the world is something that we can play a sequential game with, a repeated game with. However, in full information, we got to see the losses of all the actions we could have taken. Uh, and in bandits, we cannot. That's essentially the big difference. So here's the typical bandit protocol. And yes, these were color coordinated with vouchers. So hopefully they should be familiar. So the typical bandit finite arm protocol is that you're given some game length and a number of arms, K. Okay? And for each of capital T rounds, the learner picks some uh, arm. And then the adversary simultaneously picks some reward that maps all possible arm picks to the unit interval, or simplicity, we'll just assume everything's bounded in zero, one. And then the lever, learner observes the reward that they uh, chose, and then they see the reward that they chose. And the key difference here is that the learner does not observe the rewards that they didn't choose. So uh, unlike full information where you, know, you can go back and evaluate how well other actions would have done in the past, you can't do that explicitly in depth. And that's, I guess, the, the key uh, tension that this, uh, this formalism brings up. And just like in full information, we're going to try to control the regret. And in this case, uh, the regret's a random variable, and it's just defined as the best action in hindsight minus the regret that we actually obtained. Right. So this from the left is the best that you could have gotten had you uh, known what would have been the best arm. And the term on the right is just the reward that you actually ended up getting. And uh, Unlike full information, this is actually a random variable. So we'll have to maybe take an explication or something. But for now, what does uh, bandits have to do with our own? Well, we can think of a bandit as like a really, really simple MDP where you have one state and you always transition from one state. So you're just playing an action, seeing that reward, and then you're staying in the state. So that kind of maybe is a little too simplistic, but actually the bandit strategy has enough structure to be able to teach you something. This is something that we could you know, hopefully apply to RL. So as I kind of mentioned before, there's this tension between exploration and exploitation. Probably heard about this exploration exploitation trade-off before, but the main idea is you every round have to try to do two competing things. One is explore. You want to find out what arms are good. Um, and the only way you can do them is by playing them. So that means sometimes you'll have to play suboptimal actions um, purposefully or actions you think might be suboptimal, but maybe they won't end up being. Um, the other thing you might want to try to do is exploit, which is to play actions that have done well before. And you're always trying to balance these two, these two uh, competing goals. Right? And uh, exploration and exploitation is mostly absent in full information, but in RL, it's a pretty important problem. So we're, I guess the hope is that some of the algorithms, some of the insights we have from the Batten case, we can sort of report some of the techniques will be uh, applicable to RL. And we'll uh, see a little bit of that tomorrow. And unlike RL, uh, the bandit algorithm is pretty simple. And it's simple enough to allow for really comprehensive theory for some of these very easy uh, problem instances. By comprehensive, I mean we have uh, upper and lower bounds that match up to constants. And we really can understand how hard learning is in some of these, some of these games. Uh, additionally, we can easily incorporate adversarial data, or right? I didn't really specify anything about how the rewards are generated. Uh, and all, all we really kind of assume is that, uh, the, I guess that the adversary can see our current strategy at the current round, but maybe not the exact realization of say the, the strategy that we're picking. So we'll have to be forced to play, well, we must play randomly and the adversary can see what random strategy we're using, but not actually the 
loss that we, the actual actual action that we sample, because if the adversary could see that, then they would just give all the reward to all the arms that we aren't playing, right? So the other arms would be good and we would have a high, high reward in the comparator and then our reward would be very small. So we must play randomly. And this bandit setting has a couple of algorithmic design principles. And I think I'll, uh, I'm planning to align the talk around presenting three or four that could be useful and that have been useful in the RL setting. Okay, so let's think about the regret for a second. And uh, I kind of copied it at the top again. And here the regret is a random variable that we don't really observe. It is the best action in hindsight minus the actual rollout that we got. So we don't observe what RT of A is, right? We can't actually evaluate what this left hand term is, but of course we can you know, try to take a uh, expectation with at least our randomness. So the easiest thing we can possibly hope to control is called the pseudo regret. The pseudo regret is the maximum over kind of the expected regret. And here the expectation is with respect to the, the randomization of the learner. And it's the difference between the expected regret of the best action uh, versus the expectation over our own plays. Um, slightly harder than that sometimes is the expected regret which is just literally the expectation of the regret. And the difference here is that this comparator term A might depend on the actions that we actually played in the past. Um, you can show that if uh, the adversary is kind of simple, these two are equal, but generally the expect expected regret is an upper bound. We can also ask for high, pro high probability bonds on the realized regret. So actually trying to find uh, a bound on R of T, the random variable that holds with high probability. And uh, these are all things that people try to do, but for this talk, we'll pretty much stick with pseudo regret because it's the easiest and there are some pretty precise results for it. Uh, I also, I guess I mentioned that the pseudo regret is always upper bounded by expected regret. And uh, we might consider different types of adversaries. So in Valder's case, you have this super, uh, super difficult adversary that could actually even see your play this round. Um, this, that's maybe a little too hard, but we can consider uh, what we call reactive adversaries, meaning that the distribution of the uh, the regret the reward function we see this round could depend on our actual actions in the past. Um, sometimes it makes a lot of sense con to consider oblivious adversary. So oblivious adversary basically chooses all the rewards or at least distributions of the rewards before the game actually starts. So this is uh, a pretty natural case when you're dealing with IID data, because in that case, the rewards are just sampled from some probability distribution, and there isn't any adaptiveness to your plays going on here. Uh, and in the case of oblivious adversaries, the pseudo regret is equal to the expected regret. So that kind of helps justify dealing with pseudo regret as a, uh, as a proxy for the, the real regret. Okay, so this talk, we're gonna focus on some popular bandit problems. Um, I will introduce the adversarial bandit problem, the stochastic bandit problem, and also the pure acceleration bandit problem with the idea that these are useful primitives for RL. Uh, given time, we'll talk briefly about contextual bandits. And for these problems, we'll solve them using a variety of algorithm techniques. And I'll try to present the proofs of simple versions of these algorithms in as much detail as I can. And the uh, uh, design principles we'll concentrate on are exponential weights, which we've seen quite a bit in Bowder's talk. Uh, optimism, or also known as optimism in the face of uncertainty, and probability matching, which is more often known as Thompson sampling. And for the pure exploration bandits, we'll talk about action elimination. So each of these design principles kind of give rise to algorithms that solve these specific bandit problems, and often they give rise to very uh, clean analysis as well. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at. But I really want to highlight with this slide that there's a lot of different ways we could expand on the bandit problem. There's a lot of different bandit problems that have been considered, right? You might think of different data models for the rewards. Uh, we will we'll look at uh, adversary and IID, but there's other intermediate models as well. Uh, you might look at different action spaces. So in this talk, we're pretty much going to focus on a finite number of arms, but just like you saw in Bowder's talk, they could be uh, some functional optimization over uh, a real vector sp space, in which case you're doing you know, online bandit optimization. They can be combinatorial. That's pretty interesting. When you're trying to pick, say, paths on a graph, and you could only observe the uh, links of the corresponding to the path, like the weights of the links that you picked, or maybe you only get to see the uh, total length of the path that you took. Uh, there's different objectives, right? Pseudo regret, 
um, the actual re realized regret. And I guess you can think of best arm identification as a different objective called simple regret. There's a connection here, but uh, that's one more way you could uh, push push the bandit theory. And there is the presence of side information, right? Uh, also known as contextual bandits. And this is not a comprehensive slide, but there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different directions that people have looked at for the bandit problem. So we're just gonna look at the most basic ones. Okay, so let's start with uh, adversarial bandits. So with adversarial bandits, uh, well, let me just restate the protocol. So for the adversarial bandit only, we've suddenly become pessimistic so we can uh, kind of play better with our full information brothers. And this is uh, stated in terms of losses. Usually for bandits, you see things in terms of rewards, but for the proofs for adversarial bandits, it's just easier to do things in losses, even though they're kind of, uh, you can convert between the two. So for this adversarial bandit problem, we're given a game length t and the number of arms k. And then for each little t from one to t, the learner will pick some action in this set and the adversary will simultaneously pick some loss that maps every single action to zero one. And then the learner will observe the loss that they saw and receive that loss. And of course they don't see the losses of any, other, any of the other arms. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, randomization of IT is essential that you can very easily show that any deterministic algorithm from the learner can be made to take linear regret, which is to say, get a constant amount of loss every round, which is pretty bad because you're not really learning in that case. Um, and if you look at this algorithm, you might think, well, this is pretty similar to the experts setting. Maybe we could just think of uh, trying to estimate what LT is from the feedback that we actually get. That's the first uh, idea you might try. And indeed, that's actually called the EXP3 algorithm, which stands for uh, Exponential Ways for Exploitation, Explo Exploration, Exploitation, I believe. And that is exactly the idea of running exponential weights on an estimate of the loss. So here's the algorithm itself. And here I, I've used P's instead of the W's that Valter did. I mean, W's appear, but basically, you at every round from rounds uh, t equals one to t, you sample your action and then you observe the loss. And then, oh, if I click on the next slide, no, it will not, great. Then you estimate the entire loss vector or the loss at all the actions from this, what's known as an importance weighted estimate, right? So this is basically says that this estimates the loss as being zero at every single point, except for the arm that you actually picked, in which case it gets amplified by one over PTIT. So if you say have a, a action you think is not very suboptimal and you don't put a lot, of, uh, a lot of weight on it, then the times that you do pick that action, you want to account for the fact that you're really expecting to not pay the action very often. So you need to boost up its, its weight, that's kind of the idea. And this LT hat is just the cumulative loss estimates. And as you've seen for exponential weights, all it does is it plays arm i proportional to e to the minus eta times the cumulative loss. But in this case, it's the estimated cumulative loss. And WT is your uh, uh, partition function or what you need to get these probabilities to actually sum to one. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I got it right. That's what EXP3 stands for. and L hat is the important, important way to estimate. And you can check really easily, and this is a, a standard trick that you see all throughout RL and uh, machine learning, that L hat is L hat T is unbiased. Indeed, if you just write out what this is, you take the expectation with respect to the actual uh, random play that you make, IT, and you write out what the form of L hat of TI is. Here, I is just the ith coordinate. Well, um, when you write that out, that's just equal to uh, by definition, L of T at IT divided by PT of IT times the indicator that IT is equal to I, right? If you write out what this expectation is, is equal to this sum. And then you'll notice that the PTs uh, cancel and the only, uh, this, this indicator will kill off all the terms in the sum except for the one corresponding with J is equal to one. So this whole expression is just equal to L of T at I. Sorry, I said J equals the one, but I meant J equals the I. So this whole expression is just equal to LT at I, which is exactly what this estimate was trying to estimate. And that's it. So 
The analysis is pretty similar. I actually won't uh, go into the details, though, once these slides are posted, they're included at the bag if you really are curious. But we're going to assume that you basically did the same sort of telescoping argument, this log sum x argument that Voucher used in the exponential weights case. And uh, ooh, I have a question. Um, I'll answer this question later. Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> um, maybe on the next slide. So the, uh, the telescoping argument is uh, you do exactly the same thing. And once you do some rearrangement, you'll get uh, a term that looks really similar to what uh, Valder had. You have the, a sort of expected regret. So in the full information case, this left-hand side was just the actual difference in losses. Here, we have to take an expectation. And the right hand said, we still have this log k over eta plus eta times something that's sort of linear. And I believe this was the actual value of the losses, but instead we have basically this variance-like term where we have to account for the fact that um, LT hat is random. Uh, fortunately, we can uh, bound, uh, bound the terms and compute the left-hand side really easily. So the left-hand side is just uh, an application that, or we just use the fact that it's uh, unbiased, right? So the expectation of L hat and the expectation of big L hat are just equal to the right values. So this is just equal to the sum of P T of J, L T of J, which is, as we can see, the pseudo regret. Or if we pick I star to be the actual best, it would be the pseudo regret. So since this analysis basically was for an arbitrary I star. It holds for the best I star. So this is a lower bound on uh, RT, actually an upper bound on RT, sorry. That's a typo. Um, and the other thing we have to do is to bound this variance term. And uh, the variance term is fortunately, surprisingly easy to get a control to get control over. And we can just do this by direct, by direct calculation. So if you plug in what the actual uh, form of LT hat is, you see that you get the expectation, and this expectation is, is with respect to this random IT that you chose. It's expectation of the sum over J of PJ of LT squared over PT IT, big IT squared times the indicator function. Um, well, that we can upper bound by saying the losses are bounded. So this LT squared is just upper bounded by one squared. And this is this expression. And then we notice that the sum has, again, uh, this, this property that this will drop out for all it not equal to i. So we're left with the expectation of 1 over pt it. And when we evaluate this, this is equal to k, because this is just the sum from i equals 1 to k of pt i divided by pt i. OK. So once we can, we plug those in. This is the final exponential weights analysis like bound that we have. And as usual, we have to go and then figure out what the right eta is. So with the right eta, we get that the pseudo regret of UCB is upper bounded by square root of two TK log K. And we'll kind of see that this is off by a factor of K. And that's compared with full regret, this is off by a factor of K, this extra K in here. And that's the price for partial information, right? This is the price for having to explore multiple actions and therefore take some optimal regret on those rounds. Uh, okay, so, um, oh, someone answered the question, thank you. Uh, and as we have done in the last one, in this talk, I will also point out lower bounds when they're relevant because we have a comprehensive theory and that sometimes gives us lower bounds. So a lower bound on the adversarial bandit problem is that the pseudo regret has to be at least square root of TK. Um, that's pretty good because that exp3 algorithm we saw had only a log k factor off. So already this you know, pretty simple shove in the importance weighted estimates into, EX, into exponential weights does pretty well. And uh, it's known how to shave off this extra log k. There's a couple algorithms that do that. The first one was the implicit normalized, normalized forecaster by Odie Bear and Blue Bear in 2009. And that's uh, basically mirror descent. OK, so what upgrades can we have on this scenario? 
Well, the first thing you might ask is, Alan, you told me about pseudo regret. What about high probability bounds? Well, you can indeed get high probability bounds, but not with this algorithm. The problem with, with EXP3 is that these importance weights have way too much variance to be able to control. So getting high probability bounds is impossible. So you have to do something more clever. So one uh, option is to add a little regularization parameter to this LT hat, and then to also control the probability distribution by missing it a little bit with the uniform. And that has the uh, effect of keeping these PTs bounded away from zero, so you can actually get uh, an upper bound on this LT hat. Uh, another more elegant solution is by Gerge, who's sitting around here somewhere. Oh, hey, Gerge. Then uh, that's using explicit, or explicit exploration where you have this little gamma T at the bottom. So this basically has the same effect of keeping the probabilities well bounded. And you can push through these analyses and get high probability bounds. Uh, there are other ways you can generalize this. You can look at, you can mix bandits and experts. So instead of each arm being a single action, you can think of each arm being an expert and experts will then recommend different actions that you can take. And then your, uh, your choice is which expert do you follow and which action do you then pick? And that was solved by the exp4 algorithm, which is actually pretty similar to the exp3 algorithm in the same paper. Uh, you can compete with strategies that can switch. And much like in the full information case, you can assume that your comparators are allowed a certain number of switches. Uh, you can have feedback that isn't just of the actions that you pick, but that's determined by some graph. So all your actions are embedded on a graph. And when you play a, an action, you get to see the loss of all the neighbors as well. Um, that's one generalization that makes the game easier. Another generalization that makes the game harder is partial monitoring, where you don't even get to see the loss of the action that you picked. Instead, you have some sort of feedback, uh, some signaling graph that you get to observe. Um, but there's a lot of different upgrades and extensions of this, um, of these sort of algorithms, of this problem setting, actually. OK, so that was adversarial bandits. So let's look at stochastic bandits, which is the next big thing. And stochastic bandits, as you can kind of guess, is just adversarial bandits when the arms are stochastic, really. So in, in this case, you have a reward distribution, uh, new one through new k over each arm. And during arm i, you pick arm big it, and then you get to see a sample from the distribution. And your goal is basically to find the arm with the highest mean. And this is the namesake of the bandit problem, because you can imagine that each arm corresponds with the slot machine, and you pull an arm, and you get that reward. And you're trying to find the slot machine with the highest mean, I mean obviously. So stochastic bandits is a really old problem. It's from at least Thompson in 1933. And the notation is that we will use is that the reward of arm i is, I guess, is sampled from mu i, and the mean will be mu i. We're going to let the best arm be i star. And we'll define, whoops, these gaps, which is the, the gap of arm i, which is the difference between the best mean you can get and the mean if you played arm i. And we'll also need to denote the number of pulls n, I, n sub i t, which is the number of pulls of arm i up and up through the first t uh, pulls of the algorithm. And then the empirical mean mu hat of i t is uh, the empirical mean of arm i on all the all of the samples you got from arm i up until time t. OK. Uh, so the regret, the notion of regret, expected regret, is uh, very, has a very nice decomposition in this case. And as I mentioned on slide two, for, uh, for oblivious adversaries, the expected regret and the two regret are equal. So when the adversaries are not even adversaries when they're just stochastic, that means that the pseudo regret and the expected regret are equal. So we'll unabashedly just talk about expected regret in this case. Well, what's the expected regret? Well, it's the best, is the regret of the best thing you could have gotten, which is just t times mu i, right? If you knew what the best arm is, you would only play that, minus the expectation of the arms of the samples you actually played. And this is kind of a, a regret that works by per arm or works over rounds, but you might think of how the regret decomposes per, um, per arm. So basically every time you play uh, a suboptimal arm, you incur an expectation that delta i. So the regret is also equal to the sum over arms i of delta i times expected number of times you would have pulled that arm at the end of the game, which is n i t. And this is usually the form we will use. So for all the analysis we'll see, we will bound expectation of n i comma t and then add them together with a delta in front. Okay, and 
we'll need some sort of assumption on the tail of the, uh, of the reward distributions. One simple assumption is that they're bounded, but it's not that hard to just generalize the sub-Gaussian reward distribution. So just to refresh everyone's memory, we'll say that a random variable is one sub-Gaussian if effectively it had Gaussian tails. So that means this sort of turnoff style inequality is, is zero, but you might think conceptually of the random variable as having tails that drop off slower than a unit Gaussian. Um, importantly, if the var random variable is one sub-Gaussian, then we have this Hufting bound which just says that the probability that the empirical mean concentrates around the true mean and the probability that the empirical mean is more than epsilon greater than the true mean drops off really quickly. It drops off like e to the minus epsilon squared t over two. Okay, and we'll use this over and over again, but this is a very standard result. So let's think about this, this, this problem, right? What's the first algorithm you might try? Well, it might be uh, explore then commit. And explore then commit is pretty aptly named in that you explore all the arms and then you commit to the best one and you pull it till the end of the game. So explore and the commit really has one parameter m. And for the first m times k rounds, it just chooses that arm. It, it, it chooses uh, in round robin arm, and I guess t mod k. And then it computes all the empirical means and then it follows the best arm. Well, in that case, the regret is very easy to calculate, right? We'll calculate the regret by bounding this expectation over NT. And well, what's NT? The expectation over NT is equal to M because you definitely pull every arm N times plus it's equal to T minus MK times the probability that you selected that arm I, right? So remember after MK rounds, you try to find what the best arm is and then you fold that for the rest of the game. So if that happens, you will incur another T minus MK pulls of that arm. And if it doesn't, then you'll incur another zero pulls on that arm. Okay, so we want to bound, uh, bound that quantity. And bounding this quantity actually turns out to be pretty straightforward. So when do you choose arm i to follow? Well, you choose arm i when the empirical mean of i is greater than the empirical mean of i star, right? And uh, we can then just add the gaps back in. So if you add a, uh, a mu i, sorry, a delta i to this side, and then add a delta i star minus delta i to this side and rearrange, what we'll see is we're just left with two, well, we're left with a zero mean random variable here and a zero mean random variable here. So this whole probability is a question about the difference of two means of, or the difference of the means of two zero mean one some got some random variables being greater than delta i. So that is also a question of a single square root two over m sub Gaussian random variable being greater than delta i. And if we use Hupting's bound, this is just how big it is. It's smaller than e to the minus m delta i squared over four. Then we take that and we shove it back into our algorithm and we show that the expected regret is upper bounded by the sum over i of, oops, should, that should be a one, of delta i times the number of times we pulled arm i, or the expected number of times we pulled arm i, which is m plus t minus mk e to the minus m delta squared over four, uh, which is sort of a, an awkward thing. And the first impulse you probably have is to try to tune m to make this have like a, a t in it, would be a more simple function of t. And that turns out to be kind of hard, but in the two arm case, you can see that if you know delta, then you can set m to be roughly one over delta squared times log t of delta. And the total bound unexpected rate you get is order k uh, log t over delta. The problem with this is that you have to know what delta is, and that's not really a reasonable assumption. So can we be adaptive? And that sort of brings us to our second algorithm design principle, the first being exponential weights. And the second that we'll talk about today is OFU or optimism in the face of uncertainty. And the main idea is as follows. You establish some confidence set on where you think the true parameters could be. Then you take the most favorable, plausible set of parameters, and then you play greedily. That's, that's why it's optimism in the face of uncertainty because you're being optimistic. So here's what this algorithm looks like. It's the famous UCB1 algorithm. And it works as follows. So first, it just plays every round once. Then on subsequent rounds, it computes this upper confidence bound. So it, b i of t minus 1 is equal to square root of 6 log t over the number of times you pull arm i. And this 
has a, a Hufti mount like flavor to it. And that's exactly why you need to have something of this form. And then you choose the arm that maximizes the upper confidence bound, that maximizes the empirical mean of arm I plus this bound of arm I. Then once you choose that, you observe a sample from this distribution and then you update. Right, so let's think about this uh, with an illustration. So here, this is, I guess, maybe around four because we've pulled all arms one time, but we have three arms and we can kind of guess that arm one is better than arm two is better than arm three, but we're not entirely certain. But these are plotting uh, the empirical means and also the upper and lower confidence bounds, though really we only need the upper ones. So in arm one, we have these confidence bounds for the means and we're going to be optimistic. We're going to say, I'm going to assume that the true mean of arm one is at the very top of this interval. The true mean of arm two is at the top of this interval and the true mean of arm three is at the top of this interval. In that case, what's the greedy thing to do? We'll also play arm one. So that's what we do, we play arm one. Um, then we see that we got more information. So the confidence interval on this arm uh, shrinks a bit. And now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do the same sort of counterfactual. And in this case, the true mean of arm two um, is plausibly better than the true mean of all the other arms. So we pick arm two. And we see that arm two kind of decreases. And on the third round, then we'll want to pick arm three because now this UCB is bigger. And uh, we've kind of seen that this algorithm naturally balances exploration and exploitation because if it picks an arm, then it's likely that either that arm has a really high empirical mean or that arm hasn't seen that many samples. So the, uh, so the, um, sorry, it's got a notification. So the uncertainty is really large. Okay. Uh, what does the analysis look like? It's actually not super bad to at least bound analysis for the simple case. And the key insight here is to think, to define MI to be equal to 12, right? some constant times log big T over delta I squared. What is MI? Well, MI is about the number of times you would expect to pull arm I before we eliminate our arm I as being the best, right? We need to pull arm I roughly one over delta I, big delta I squared times to be able to uh, narrow it down to a region of size delta i. And that log t there is because we're using a union bound over time. So that's kind of why we have to set um, the upper bounds to be the size that they are. Namely, if we choose b of it given uh, what the algorithm specifies, that means that b of it is less than or equal to delta i, delta i over t once we've seen at least mi samples. So the intuition of the proof is pretty much the same as the one from explore and commit. So we try to bound the expected number of pools of all the suboptimal arms, right? And that's just equal to the, uh, the sum over all the events that we pull arm I at round T. And that is upper bounded by MI plus the probability that we will pull arm I in the future, right? So the number of times we'll pull arm I after we've pulled it MI times already. And the idea is that we will, with very small probability, not pull an arm more than mi times, which means that the total regret will be about the sum of delta i times mi, which is what it turns out being. So uh, on the next slide, we kind of just bound this probability. So uh, we can do this in a picture, so why not? Uh, the claim is that if we are so we want to bound the probability of choosing arm i. And what we really have are these notions of upper confidence bounds. And we kind of want to argue that if the upper, upper confidence bounds are correct, then we won't make this mistake. And then we'll argue that the upper confidence bounds are almost always correct. So if we make this mistake and we actually choose arm i after m i, that means that, well, first we know that mu um, so condition on the events that the upper confidence bounds are correct, then we know that mu hat i plus, sorry, mu hat i star plus b i star is greater than mu i. And we know that mu i star, and we know that mu i star is more than 2b times mu i, because that's how we chose m. Right? We chose m such that b would be smaller than delta i over 2. Well, how far can mu hat plus uh, bi b from mu, well, it could be one size of bi from just having the mean be a noisy estimate, and then we add another b on it. But still, once we've added both of these in the most pessimistic way possible, we see that we really still can't get it so that mu hat i bt is bigger than the upper confidence bound of the best arm. So 
if that actually happens, if we actually pick arm i, that means that one or both of these confidence intervals must be false. So that's this inequality, right? If we pick this arm, then either this, the mu uh, hat i confidence interval is incorrect or the mu hat i star confidence interval is incorrect. And we can bound uh, both of those just using simple algebra, right? We, unfortunately, this b has uh, an nit, which is a random variable. So we can just take a uh, union bound over it. We add them up, we shove in, this expression into our Hufting bound, and we just get out, we do some algebra and get out of t to the minus two. Um, and the similar thing holds for the mu hat i star case. So when we do that, uh, like I promised earlier, we bounded this expectation, we shoved it back into our vertical composition, and we get that the regret is upper bounded by the sum over arms of the gap of arm i plus two log t over delta i squared plus lower order stuff we don't care about. Okay. So uh, that's this theorem. And of course, the question is, how good can we do? And the answer is actually rather famous. It's the Lyon Robbins lower bound from 1985. And it basically shows that um, for any admissible algorithm, so basically an algorithm that does well on most problem, on all problem instances, the pseudo regret divided by log t has to grow at least um, equal, whoops, at least as quickly as. Uh, log t and the constant has to be delta i over the KL of uh, the difference between arm i and arm i star. And for like the Bernoulli case, for example, the KL divergence is of order uh, delta i squared. So this whole thing is of order one over delta i. So we're kind of like a log t off of this lower bound. Or sorry, we're, or, yeah, we're um, getting like within constants for this lower bound, right? Because log t is, is on the left. So that's pretty good. Um, okay, so that was how well optimism did. And there's still room for improvement, but you know, we kind of feel that we've gotten at least a good portion of the way there. And the algorithm design principle that really helped us was uncertainty, uh, which isn't the only algorithm design principle we could have used. In fact, we're going to use uh, probability matching instead. So for probability matching, which is a totally different way of solving the same problem, we're going to put a prior over means and then look at a likelihood. Right. So we'll have priors over mean i and a likelihood new i, which gives us a sample given uh, mu i. And what we want to do is we want to pull arm i equal to the probability that arm i is actually the best. That's the matching part. Um, and you might know this algorithm by its other name. It's called usually Thompson sampling. And Thompson sampling uh, works exactly that way. So you can implement this probability of choosing arm i proportional to the probability that arm i is the best by instead drawing some sample from his, from his posterior and then picking the sample that's the highest. So this is just a different way of, of sampling according to this probability. So um, that's what we do. Then once we have the arm, of course, we, re we observe the reward and we update the posterior of the arm that we pulled. OK, so here's kind of a, an idea of what this sort of looks like. And the first thing you might wonder as well, is this Bayesian? No, not really. Uh, a, Bayesian would put a prior like we did over the problem instances, but then would solve the problem under that prior and would prove something of the Bayes optimal regret, the expected regret underneath once you like integrate all the uh, prior parameters. Instead, we're only using this posterior as a uh, algorithm tool. So we're not at, we're not really integrating with respect to the prior, we're getting uh, a freaking just bound, which is to say an instance dependent performance bound. Uh, so why is this a sensible thing to do? Well, if you kind of think of this photo or this, this cartoon, if mu hat i is high, then we will tend to pick arm i. Right? Remember the sampling procedure is to generate a posterior sample from this distribution, generate a posterior sample from this distribution, and then see which one's higher and choose that one. So if mu, uh, mu i tends to be high, we'll tend to select it more often. Um, also, if mu if we haven't seen mu very often and it has a really large spread, like mu, uh, whoops, it should be, this is mu one, like mu one has here, then there'll be some non trivial chance that we'll play it. So we'll do some exploration as well. Um, the reason why people really like Thompson sampling is it is more aggressive than UCB and tends to do better in practice. Um, the downside is that the analysis is much more difficult because you don't have this upper confidence property to sort of exploit. And uh, the first analysis of this algorithm was um, Arkel and Goyle in 2013. And they showed that the regret of the beta, gamma beta Thompson sampler, where you just have 
um, gamma priors or beta priors and the gamma likelihood is exactly equal to what you would hope it would be. It's uh, you know some over t of delta i t times log t over the KL, which is sort of the optimal order that you, could, you might hope. And then I mentioned the uh, proof is a lot more technical. So I'm just going to very vaguely talk about how the proof sort of works. And the idea, again, is to break down the expected regret into the expected number of suboptimal plays. And the expectation can be broken down to these three, oops, into these three cases. So here we're going to think about um, mu1 is the optimal arm and mu2 is the suboptimal arm. We're going to think about two points in between which we'll have to tune to get the analysis to work out. And if we're choosing arm two in this case, well, um, arm two can happen for a couple of, in a couple of different circumstances. One is if the mean of arm two is well behaved. So that means it's, it's less than XT, so it's close to the true mean, but the posterior sample of arm two happens to be really big. Right? And that we can control because once the mean concentrates, the posterior tends to concentrate. Um, another thing that could happen is the mu arm is small and the posterior sample isn't that uh, large. So both are kind of well behaved. And in this case, you're generally picking arm, the suboptimal arm, when you got a really bad sample from, really bad posterior sample from the optimal arm. So this sort of happens when you don't have enough samples from the optimal arm. We have to show that it doesn't happen that often. And then the last case that might happen is if uh, the mean of arm i is just like crazy and you didn't learn it that well. And that doesn't happen just through concentration, right? We know that the mean mu hat i concentrates around the true mean. So this is the tricky case. And they basically rely on this lemma that shows that the probability of picking arm i, given that arm i has reasonable mean rewards and need a reasonable posterior sample, is bounded by some constant uh, times the probability of picking the best arm which means that this problem of not having picked the best arm goes away exponentially quickly. And in fact, this whole contribution to the regret is order one. So I know that was super high level, um, but you can go read the proof. It's actually pretty digestible. You just can't fit it into a tutorial. Okay. So uh, quick aside, you might have said, well, we have stochastic algorithms and adversarial algorithms, and they're really different. Can we somehow get the best of both worlds? Um, we know that the regret for adversarial has to be square root TK, and then the regret for stochastic has to be logarithmic. Um, so, you know, what's can we adapt without knowing the setting? And people have tried this. So, one of the first examples was uh, an algorithm proposed by Bubek and Slivkins, and they assumed an ID problem and then did basically a, a hypothesis test to determine whether they fall into an adversarial regime or not. And once they do, then they'll switch to an adversarial algorithm. Um, but recently, this problem was answered um, more precisely, at least in the case of pseudo regret, with a variant of the online mirror descent. So, this algorithm, which is online mirror descent with a sort of weird half Salus entropy, which is a Salus entropy corresponding with alpha equals a half, which I've written down here, but it's not clear at all why it's special from the way it's written, is able to simultaneously get the optimal regret, optimal. Uh, pseudo regret bounds in both cases without knowing which one is which. And uh, this is not possible for not pseudo regret. And it's certainly not possible in best arms, but for pseudo regret, you can totally do this, which is really surprising. And um, it's definitely worth digging into what this algorithm is actually doing and why half salus entropy is a really good idea. OK, so here's one more different problem we could think about, which is called pure exploration. So, so far, everything we've done has been uh, has been on regret, minimizing regret. So we're playing this repeated game and we care about how much we're wasting as we're playing. But that's not always the case. Maybe we really, really just want to find out what the best arm is and we don't care about how many samples we have to spend to figure that out. We're doing some exploratory research or doing clinical trials or something like that. And it's easy to motivate these sort of problems. So in that case, what should our algorithms look like? Right. We kind of want to explore more. So in the cumulative regret case, you tend not to pull arms you think are suboptimal. But in pure exploration, you kind of want to really make sure you're getting the optimal algorithm and the optimal arm. So this problem is known as best arm identification or pure exploration. And the protocol is as such. So given uh, K arms and arm distributions, new one to new K, every round you pick an arm, you observe 
a sample from the arm, and you decide whether you want to stop or not. Stop or not. At the end, you have to return an arm. And there's two things you might hope to do. One is you might hope to have fixed confidence. So that means that you keep on selecting samples and it's up for the learner to decide when to stop and they want to guarantee that they found the right arm with high confidence. And the other is fixed budget where you have a fixed budget and you want to maximize the probability of getting the right arm under this budget constraint. And uh, we'll, we'll only consider fixed confidence but fixed budget is a thing that people look at. Okay, so generally, as I've mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, stochastic regret minimization bandits under explore. Um, we can sometimes fix them to do the right thing. So two sort of examples of this are LUCB, which pulls not only the arm with the highest upper confidence bound, but the arm with the uh, lowest lower confidence bound that's higher than the lower confidence bound or the higher than the lower confidence bound of the best arm. Um, we can also adapt Thompson sampling, which does top, top two. So instead of sampling the, uh, taking a, a sample of all the posteriors and then taking the arm that corresponds with the highest sample, you instead keep on resampling until you get a different arm and then you use that one instead. And that encourages Thompson sampling to explore more and kind of does the right thing. Um, but like I said, I want to introduce more algorithm design principles, so why not pass up an opportunity to do that? So here's another algorithm design principle, action elimination. And a lot of these best arm algorithm uh, algorithms, best arm identification algorithms are using action elimination to design their algorithms. So this is one of the earliest and um, it's one on the simple side, but it actually gets within the lock of the lower bound. It's called successive elimination. And the basic idea is that you keep a list of plausibly best algorithms and you, every round, you pull all the algorithms still in your list, and then you see which ones aren't plausibly best anymore and you throw them away. So in this case, you're comparing the maximum um, uh, empirical mean in your plausible set minus some uh, confidence bound with the, all the other means plus the confidence bound. So this is uh, uh, intuitively the lowest that mu star could be. And this is the highest that mu i could be. And then if the lowest mu star could be still higher than the highest mu i could be, then you're pretty confident that mu i is not the optimal arm and you throw it out. And you keep on iterating this procedure until you're left with a set of size one and you return that. Um, so the nice thing about action elimination algorithms is they tend to have pretty straightforward analysis. At least this one does. In fact, it fits all in one page, the proof. So let's just go through it because maybe it's a useful exercise. Uh, the main idea is you define this bad event. And the bad event is the event that one of the confidence intervals doesn't hold. Um, you know that this happens with small probability. In fact, you can calculate this. So what's the probability of one of the confidence intervals not holding? Well, we use the union bound. So it's the sum over all it of the probability that the confidence interval didn't hold for that arm i at that time t. And given that this is the UCB that we chose, we just plug it in and we use Hupting's bound again. And we get that this union bound is uh, the probability of the bad event is upper bounded by the sum over it of two times e to the minus half log k t squared over delta. Um, and then we pull push through the expectation and we do some summing and we found this is just less than delta. So with high probability, all our confidence bounds are correct. And of course, this didn't happen by accident. We had to choose the confidence bounds so that they would add up. Uh, you can choose any sort of confidence bounds that hold across all time if you want, but this is one that does. Okay, so with high probability we're in, we don't have this bad event happening. Now we show correctness of the algorithm. So if the bad event doesn't happen, we wanna show that the algorithm is correct. Well, if the bad event doesn't happen, that means our confidence intervals are always correct for all arms at all time, um, which means that at time at round J, if we look at the difference between mu hat j and mu hat i, well, we can just add and subtract mu j and mu i. So this is less than, or this is uh, less than mu hat i minus, sorry, uh, mu i star minus mu hat i star plus the gap plus mu hat j minus uh, mu j. And this whole thing, right, this is less than or equal to zero. This is bounded by a Hupting bound, or given the Hupting bound is correct, this is less than B. And given that the Hupting bounds are correct, this is also less than B. So this whole thing is less than 2B. And if you look back at the previous algorithm, 
the previous slide, which I guess I can do pretty easily, you'll see that arm mu i is eliminated only if it is more than 2b smaller than the best. So in that case, uh, arm i star will never be eliminated because it is never more than 2b smaller than the best arm in this class. So you never remove i star. That, that's the goal, right? Condition on the good event happening, i star is never eliminated from your plausibly best pool. Then you notice that as you go, uh, as the game progresses, this bi will eventually go to zero. So you will eliminate every single arm except for one. And by induction, that has to be the best arm. So with high probability, right, with probability equal to the probability of the bad event not happening, this algorithm will terminate with the optimal arm. So that's the correctness proof. Um, and the second part of the proof is asking about sample complexity. Right? What is the sample complexity? How many times does it have to pull arms in order to stop? And uh, okay, I kind of lied saying that it fits on one slide because this is sort of hand waving, but at, at a high level, you need to pull arm i enough so that uh, delta i is smaller than two of bt and you can actually eliminate it. And you kind of compute, you can in invert this bound and show that that actually needs order delta i uh, to minus two times log k over delta i squared. And then you add these up for every arm and that's effectively the order of the total sample complexity, right? It's uh, sum over i of uh, one over square, the square of the gap plus log k over delta uh, big delta. And this is nicely put on this slide. Uh, so of course there are lower bounds too. And the lower bound is that every best arm identification algorithm, um, or rather for every best arm identification algorithm, there is a problem instance that requires at least uh, delta i over log i, the delta i to the minus two times log log one over delta, delta i squared samples. So we're like a log k off and uh, a log log off as well. And there are fancier algorithms that do actually get this log log bound. Um, the log log bound kind of has something to do with the law of iterative logarithms, so it shouldn't look too weird. But um, you have to be a lot more careful about how often you compare actions. Successive elimination is sort of the, the simplest way of doing it. But it's also one of the simplest and kind of appropriate for a boot camp. Yeah, so that's kind of best arm identification. Um, and I guess we have a little bit of time, so I can maybe quickly go into linear stochastic bandits. So this is almost a contextual bandit, and it's the last thing that we'll consider. And uh, the setting is as such. So given a game like the number of arms k, as usual, the learner now sees some context. So they see one context per context per arm, c1 all the way to ck of t. And they're given new set of context vectors every arm. And the learner picks an action, and then they get Oops, I just dropped my mouse. And that's why I went like four slides ahead today. And then they get the inner product between the context that they picked and some uh, theta star they don't know plus noise. And the regret is with respect to an agent that knows the true theta. So if an agent knows the true theta, what they would do is just see which of these contexts is closest to the true theta and pick that. And that's exactly what this is. So in this form of formulation, the regret of the adversary uh, isn't tying all the rounds together. It's just doing the best action every round. Um, so maybe this might seem harder because you can have a different optimal action best every round. But on the other hand, there's a lot of shared learning that happens because if you know theta star, then you can really narrow down what the optimal action is. And you can kind of learn theta star because it's constant across rounds. Um, and the one of the earliest algorithms that uh, solved this was this optimism in the face of linear bandits. I think, actually, I don't really know what awful stands for. Maybe, maybe Chava can tell us, but uh, it's, uh, what's the L for Chava? Well, it's something linear. Oh, you're oh, muted, I'm or I can't hear you. Oh, wait, that just could be me. <laughs> oh, I think my sound is broken. Good thing I can at least talk. It's optimism in the face of uncertainty for linear bandits. Simple oh, OK, great. <laughs> so, so it's that. And uh, the idea of this algorithm is pretty nice. You basically use optimism to try to guess what theta is. But instead of having a optimistic uh, estimate for every action, you have a joint optimistic estimator by having a, a confidence sequence on theta and then choosing the best theta. Right? So when you play, you choose jointly it and theta 
to maximize the objective and you are optimistic over both the actions you have and over the theta. That's, that's the insight. So the machinery you kind of need is to have a confidence sequence or confidence interval on theta. They actually used a, I like to call it a confidence sequence, but basically it's a, a confidence interval that holds across time and it's out of uh, the statistics literature it uses I guess, method of moments and some sort of martingale techniques. Um, it's De La Pena 2009 and there's other uh, pointers. I think this is actually found a bunch of really cool techniques. So I encourage everyone to go take, check them out. But the idea is you have, you do linear regression on theta star, right? So I'm here, I'm defining VT to be the covariate, like the ridge regression S version of the covariance matrix. And I'm calculating, this is the OLS, just the ordinary least squared, or I guess the ridge, ridge regression estimate of what theta is. And we're basically, you can show that with high probability, this confidence interval, this confidence sequence, which is a uh, subset of theta and says that the true theta has to be close to theta star, right? So with high probability, theta star is in this set and you have to tune what R is. So that's, that's the algorithm. And the proof is super nice. Uh, as I mentioned, the regret kind of decomposes round by round. So if you look at the, the excess regret in a single round, it's just equal to the uh, regret of the best arm minus regret of the arm that you picked, right? And now you can use optimism and say, well, since I chose the, um, I, I chose the actions optimist, optimistically, and I also chose a proxy for theta optimistically, I can use this as an upper bound and just shove this in. And then once I have, whoops, once I have this upper bound, then I just massage it a little bit and I use Koshu Schwartz and then I can bound the regret that way. So you actually get a really strong regret guarantee in this case, because you can learn a lot of joint structure. Um, yeah, so actually I somehow am pretty much exactly on time, I think. And here's my last slide, the review. So what have we looked at so far? Well, we looked at four different settings of bandits and we've looked at at least one algorithm to solve each setting. So for the adversarial bandits, we've seen our good friend, the exponential weights uh, come back and save, our, <laughs> save us again using ESP3. Right. And so Kassig bandits, we saw algorithms that really took advantage of the stochasticity of the data by using uncertainty to fit the prop model using the USB algor or UCB algorithm. Or we also looked at Thompson sampling, which did probability matching and uh, had a totally different flavor, but still got the same sort of theoretical uh, guarantees. In the pure exploration setting, we looked at action elimination algorithms, which had a pretty different flavor, even though the uh, tools were pretty similar. And then we very briefly looked at uh, linear contextual bandits work and optimism really seemed to be a good way of designing algorithms. So hopefully when you have your next sequential uh, learning or sequential decision making problem, one of these design principles will come in handy. Um, I think that's all I had. So if you have any questions, I'll be here for a bit. Um, yes, context in, uh, in stochastic linear bandits are um, arbitrary. That was the question. The question was, can context in uh, linear stochastic bandits be adversarial? Uh, yeah, they can be arbitrary. I mean, there are also um, adversarial versions of linear bandits as well, though I don't know that literature so well. I see Chaba because he just had a paper on that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that has a big literature. It's somewhat different. Uh, um, the whole problem setup is, is more similar to if you have uh, a reward and you have a uh, random noise acting on a parameter vector that, that corresponds to the adversarial setting. If you generalize that way and, and you have a sequence of arbitrary of these parameter vectors, right? So that that is a sort of different setting. Uh, I wanted to say that the, the context, whether it, it is adversary or not, actually, if it's not adversary, then maybe you can take advantage of that. So it's, yeah. So, so the result that I was talking about is not trying to take advantage of. 
if the contacts are not adversary, but if they are not, then maybe we do better. It's amazing that you were on time. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I had a lot of slides. I don't know how that happened. Okay. Um, you got another question. I, I asked it for you. In the contextual setting, since context can change over time, does that mean that we are competing against a change optimal or are we still competing against the best fixed arm in hindsight? Okay. Did you get that? Yeah, so usually in the contextual setting, you'll compete with some uh, class of policies or class of mappings from context to actions. And in that case, you can pay, you compete with the best policy. So the policies are sort of fixed, but you want to do as well as the best policy in your class. So the, the best action will change per round. So the best, the best action changes, right? But you would hope that at least in the contextual band of setting, one of the policies accurately captures the uh, the relationship between the context and the actions, and you'd want to follow that one. Okay, so another question, if the context can be adversarial, if the next context can depend on the agent's current action, then wouldn't this become RL? If, <laughs> I mean, there's also the notion of state, right? That your reward of the current round is closer to RL. It um, is it is like RL, but I think it's just the wrong regret. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like is it RL but with a simple transition? Can we never take into account if uh, the adversary kind of like chooses uh, that their choices are based on our action, uh, future choices are based on action then we don't go back and say that like, oh, if we had chosen this other action, the adversary would have done something else. That's area, right? So yeah. then not state dependent regret, but here the regret is this wishy-washy concept that uh, that is good for reductions, good for as a mathematical tool, uh, but otherwise it's like a strange regret. Uh, some people, uh, so in the literature, to make a distinction between these two regret, uh, regrets, uh, the regret that would everyone think about in the context of a real, it's called a policy regret. And this regret is not the policy regret, it's just the usual. Regret. Yeah. It's almost like a, a counterfactual, right? If yeah. I had run this other policy, this would have been the states that I would have seen, and this would have been this the actions that would have played. But and this one is like this uh, intermediate thing. Yeah. Okay. Can context for any action change over time? But I, can they change according to the history of actions? I think this would answer, or as we put us in there, I mean, yeah, yeah, we just, we yeah. just. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll click answer live on this. We done. And uh, these slides will be up. I there's a bunch of references at the back. Um, Though, if you want to learn more about that, you should check out Chapa's book. Which just came out. And there's a, a lot of, and, and Taurus. Yes, sorry, Tor. Um, and there's, oh, I don't even know why I'm doing this. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay, well, I guess it's a break until uh, Anka is giving a talk about robotics and human interaction in half an hour, right?